Um, our speaker comes to us this evening with a rich heritage of hard work, sacrifice, and a focus on education, and a deep understanding of life, both Chinese and American. Her great-great-grandfather immigrated to the U.S. in the 1800s with the goal of sending money home to China to ensure that his son and his grandson could achieve higher education. And they did. That grandson, Dr. Lin's grandfather, was a graduate in political economy from the University of Michigan. He went on to get his PhD. His daughter, Dr. Lin's mother, received her PhD from Columbia. Dr. Lin was born in Philadelphia, but moved with her parents to Taiwan, I guess it was for a year when she was in the seventh grade, because uh, they, they received a sabbatical there. So that's where she brushed up on her Chinese. And she went back and there and to become fluent in Chinese, uh, and as well learning the history, the geography, and the literature of China. Her undergraduate studies were at Princeton, and she received her PhD from the University of Chicago in political science. Prior to receiving her PhD, she did social work at the Co Covenant House in New York City, and she also consulted for the ACLU. She is the author of several books addressing reform in social policy in the prisons, the study of Arab, Arab Americans in the Detroit area, and American poverty issues. At the University of Michigan, Dr. Lin is an associate professor of public policy in the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. She currently teaches courses in public policy, implementation, gender and politics, qualitative research methods, and immigration. In 2021, she was appointed director of the Lieberthal Rogel Center for Chinese Studies at the University of Michigan. So I believe that that should be sufficient to be any credential <laughs> So please welcome Dr. Ann Chi Lin. All right, well, why is May 4th important for Chinese? May 4th, 1919, um, a group of students at Peking University filled the streets in Beijing and then were joined over the next several weeks by students from other universities, by young people and not so young people um, all through the city and in other cities in China as well. Why did they go out? They went out to protest the 21 demands that Japan had presented um, at the Conference of Versailles, to, um, which was the conference to make all things right after World War I. So those of you who, those of you might remember, um, Japan fought on the side of Great Britain and the United States and against um, the Germans in, um, in the First World War. Of course, that alliance changed um, in the Second World War. Um, but they, what they did was they moved into China to take over German territory. And so when they, as part of the victor, in the, you know, to the victor go the spoils, as a part of the you know, set of countries that won a victory in World War I, they said, we should be able to take over the German concessions, the German trading, trading, German trading relationships, um, and the German property in China. Now, China also fought on the side of the United States and Great Britain in World War I. And China said, wait a minute, like why, how come you're rewarding Japan with territory that is from China. 1911 was when the Chinese, the Qing dynasty was overthrown, the Manchu dynasty was overthrown, and China became a republic. But there was a lot of conversation 
about what kind of country, what kind of republic China should be. So this is Chen Dushou. He is a he was an early scholar of the period, a professor at the at Peking University. And in 1915, four years before the um, May Fourth Movement, he said he wrote a famous essay called "Call to Youth." And he said, "What do we want the youth of China to do? We want the youth of China to advance China." Right. to bring it back or to bring it to an important place in the world. And to do that, he said, young people, you are the spark, you are the spirit. You have not been you know, raised in the traditions and the history of these dynastic rulers. You want independence, you want freedom, you want science. You want modernization. And so he said, be independent, not servile. Be progressive, not conservative. Be quick to advance, not to retreat. Be cosmopolitan. Look out around the world, not isolationist. Be scientific and not prejudiced. And the, his argument was that the Centuries of monarchy had created a China that was servile and conservative and retreating and isolationist and prejudiced. And what China needed to do was to move beyond that. Right. What, were, what was the, the evidence that China was servile and conservative, etc., and retiring, etc., etc.? Well, it was what had happened to China, particularly in the hundred years before it became a republic. And what happened, some of you may remember the Opium War. I, I know none of you remember the Opium War, but, <laughs> <laughs> you, but you remember learning about or reading about the Opium War. Um, and so that, of course, is when Great Britain, which already had taken the country, the territory, the area of India. So they were getting tea from China. They had to pay the Chinese. And so they sold opium to the Chinese. Um, and so you can imagine that as that trade grew bigger and bigger and bigger, legal trade in opium, and people got more and more and more addicted, right, the Chinese protested. And they fought a war in the mid-18th century, the first Opium War. And in that war, China lost spectacularly. Why did it lose so spectacularly? There are lots of reasons. You didn't come here for a history course. But one of them was clearly that in the decades since the Qing came to power, the Qing Dynasty came to power, China had looked inward rather than outward. It had, no, had ceased the kinds of active interaction um, with the outside world that it had had in previous dynasties. And in looking outward, it had not gotten any of the benefits of the Industrial Revolution, um, any of the benefits of the, you know, the rise and uh, in, in importance of science. Um, and so when they lost, Great Britain said, you have to give us territory. Now we're not going to rule the territory, we're not going to like colonize the territory, except for Hong Kong, which they did take. Um, but they said in the rest of the country, there are areas where we will have precedence, where our law will prevail rather than Chinese law, you know, where our business relationships will be preferred to other business relationships. Um, and it, so these became known as concessions. And once Great Britain had concessions, other countries wanted to get in on the action as well. And so what you see here is from 1850 to 1914. The Brits are first. The Hong Kong, which is this little dot, it's not that island, it's just that dot. Um, Hong Kong is a colony. 
but Canton and this Yangtze River Delta, and of course all of the area of India, Burma, etc., those were conceded to the British. The Japanese took Taiwan, took the province across the strait from Taiwan, here's Japan of course, and then moved into Korea. The Germans had this area in, Shen, in Shandong province, including the treaty ports there, and then also mining in this area of China, mining and metals. Um, Russia moved in and took this area, Manchuria, and Manchuria is particularly significant because may, you may know that the Qing dynasty was ruled by the Manchus, the eth Manchu Manchus are an ethnicity, and the Manchurians had basically come down and taken over the country and they were ruling, and during this period, during the Manchu dynasty, the Qing dynasty, the Japanese took over their homeland. Right. So, this, oh, and the French, can't forget the French. Um, and the French, down here in um, Indochina, it was then called Southeast Asia. Um, we're all familiar with it because of the Vietnam War. But the French also pioneered this activity where in Shanghai, be, which became this international city, there are all, were all different parts of Shanghai that were cut into pieces by the different Western countries. And so you could go from French law, you know, down the street to British law, down the street to Belgian, Belgian law, etc. Okay. And so that cartoon, of course, shows, you know, a uh, Chinese, the Chinese ruler official saying, stop, stop and all the countries of Europe cutting up China. Um, after 1915, the Japanese ended up taking over not just these areas, the Taiwan, which it had had, and um, Korea, which it annexed. They moved into, they fought a war with, they moved, first they got the German areas, then they fought a war with Russia and beat Russia and were able to take over the Russian areas. And so you see that there is this ring, basically, around China that was all Japanese. And this is what the 1919 students were protesting, the fact that the West was going to let Japan create this sphere of influence. The Chinese call this period the period of national humiliation. And there's a very famous phrase which is, comes out of the May 4th movement, never forget national humiliation. You know, and so when, fast forward to the Communist Revolution and the Communist Party takes over China, it remembers this phrase, it uses this phrase, and it says, well, what does, how do, we, how do we get out of national humiliation? How do we become a country that other people respect, right? Well, first, we need economic development and economic strength. And you saw that Mao tried to create this with many different policies, among them the Great Leap Forward. And the Great Leap Forward, Chairman Mao said, we are going, we need to be able to produce everything that, you know, the West produces. We're going to do it at home. We're going to do it here. Every village is going to have its own um, metal, metal facility. It's going to be able to smelt metal and everybody should take their, you know, tin pans and their, um, you know, copper coins and throw them into the furnace and we'll make our own metal. And you can imagine that didn't happen, that didn't work very well, um, and left China really even poorer than it was. Um, the Communist Party said, we can, we, we, in order to prevent national humiliation, we need political unity in the country, and that's going to come from party leadership. 
And many of you will know about the Cultural Revolution, when this is an example of the kind of CCP leadership of the period, right, where Chairman Mao said the there are, too in, there are too many people, too many leaders, even leaders within the party who are you know, set into the old ways and they are no longer you know, motivated by the strength of the communist doctrine. Young people, you need to stand up and overthrow your elders and overthrow their traditional ways and their traditional ideas. And that was the Cultural Revolution and the Cultural Revolution didn't turn out so hot either. Um, and finally, there was this, this feeling that we need to create national independence. And under Chairman Mao, China pursued that basically with a sense of isolationism. You know, we're going to look inward and make, bring ourselves up. Um, and it also tried to establish that by creating a military that would be able to you know, to defend our borders and to defend what we think should be our borders. Um, and of course, the US fought um, China um, in the Korean War, and Chinese supported um, the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese, the Vietnam War. Um, and I would say that this didn't turn out so well for China either. Right? So what does China think that it needs today. It hasn't forgotten the phrase, national, don't forget national humiliation, but it's created a set of new strategies. One is called reform and opening, gai ge kai fang. And people just talk about it as a phrase, reform and opening, but what this refers to is the economic modernization under Deng Xiaoping, um, where China opened up to the world, first in these special economic zones where it was producing goods for export, um, and then to the large cities and the coastal areas, and then across the whole country. China says, we still believe we need party unity, and the way to get party unity, it, political unity, is, to, is through party leadership. And so, as many of you know, China has created a great firewall, which is supposed to keep out fake news, right? What's fake news? News that the party thinks is wrong or inadequate or threatening. Um, and instead, it's to establish our own internet um, internet options, internet companies. So the Great Firewall is not only, oh, is not, has not only prevented companies from, like Google or Facebook from getting into China, it's also um, pushed out, it's also created a space, excuse me, where a Chinese company, Baidu, can do exactly, can do what Google does. Baidu is their search engine. Um, where there's um, WeChat. WeChat is a combination Twitter and Apple Pay and microblogging site and Instagram. Um, all of these companies that have you know, grown up so that Chinese internet business is going to Chinese internet companies. Um, and finally, it continues to want to pursue a, a, the ability to maintain national independence. Um, and here, where you really see its strategies changing, instead of isolationism, moving towards global power um, and really cracking down on the possibility of secession um, in China. So how effective are these? And should America be worried? I would suggest, and I hope to suggest to you in today's talk, that if we understand Chinese economic development and its strength, and we take it seriously, then the question is, are we equipped for economic competition? And if we understand the 
party leadership and the political unity that CCP leadership wants to create in China, then the question is, are we confident in the American alternative? And finally, um, if we understand the fears of becoming you know, servile, of becoming a colony, of losing its national independence that China has, then the question is, can we flourish, can we learn how to flourish in a multipolar world? In other words, what I'm going to suggest to you is that these points, economic development, party leadership, national independence, are not thing, not, um, not changes, not transformations that the U.S. needs to resist. We shouldn't be thinking as the United States that we want China to be poor. We shouldn't be thinking that we want China's party leadership to change. That the, we shouldn't be thinking that the CCP will change because we want it to. You know, and we shouldn't be hoping that China will once again have the, you know, be in the position it was during the century of national humiliation when Western countries were taking bites out of it. Instead, we can not fear China's rise. We can cope with China's rise. We can even flourish during China's rise, as long as we are able to equip ourselves from economic competition, we are confident in the American alternative, and we are willing to survive in a multipolar world. All right, so let me talk about each of these quickly. First, I think we really need to realize how far China has come and how much um, pride not only the Chinese government but the Chinese people have in how far China has come. From 1950, right after the Communist Revolution to today, China's GP, GDP was the 11th lowest in the world. It was the 11th poorest country in the world. Today, it has the second highest G GDP in the world. In 1950, 85.7% of China was in extreme poverty. The U, from the international, our international measurement of extreme poverty. Today, it's under 1%. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't people who are still poor in China. The international measure of extreme poverty is about $1.90 a day. And so there are still people who are poor in China, but Almost all of the progress that the globe, that the world has made in eradicating poverty over the last 50 years, over 80% of that progress is due to China's being able to lift its people out of extreme poverty. Infant mortality, 195 deaths per 1,000 babies, now 84.5. And finally, literacy, 20% literacy in 1950 to almost 90, to 97.5 today. If we feel, if we look at China and we say, you know, your, your government is horrible, it has made no, you have made no progress, you need to change your government and become like us, Chinese are going to look at us and say, excuse me. We're doing pretty good, right? And so that's why the goal should not be, we should not be thinking, we don't want China to flourish. We want it to flourish. This is great. How has China done this? I could talk for a long time on this, but I just want to mention two important strategies. One is, sorry, I'm a professor, economic complementarity. What, when, for, when the economists talk about goods that are substitutes, they mean two types of candy. If you buy one type, you're not going to buy the other type, right? If I buy my candy from 7-Eleven, I'm not going to get it from Special K, from Circle K, right? That's a substitute. But what's a complement? Milk and cookies. The more cookies I buy, the more milk I'm going to want to buy too. Right? Those two things work together. China has pursued a strategy of economic complementarity in two ways. 
One, it said, and we all know, China started out very poor, low-wage economy. It said, we're not just going to sell cheap goods across, you know, to rich countries like the U.S. We are going to take part in the manufacturing of high-value goods, like your iPhone. Your labor is still cheaper in China than it is in the United States. And so China makes components of the iPhone that are, um, that, and, and puts together the iPhone, all things that you need a lot of people to do, and so Apple can do that cheaper in China. Right? But by creating, basically, um, a supply chain for the world, China has managed to embed itself in the local economy, in, sorry, in the global economy, right? Um, and so as other, as the U.S. buys, as the U.S. becomes wealthier, as the technological progress happens around the world, China has a piece of it too. Right, so when we move, when China's now already moved from very low wage to low wage, and now China's even beginning to send some of its high value goods to be produced in countries like Bangladesh, where wages are lower than they are, you know, for China. So it's that kind of economic interaction that has really fueled China's economic growth. And the second thing is infrastructure investment. That's a picture of the Chinese high-speed rail. Chinese high-speed rail is so good that, just think about Chicago to Houston. I can take a train from Beijing to Guangzhou, which is about the distance from Chicago to Houston. I can get on the train at 8 in the morning. I will be in Guangzhou at 5 in the afternoon. I can get from Beijing to Shanghai in about three and a half hours. The train goes 350 kilometers per minute. Uh, 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 not per hour. Yes, miles per hour, kilometers per hour. Thank you. Yes, not per minute. That would be crazy. Um, <laughs> and, China built now, and China has trains all over the country. China also has highways. China has also invested in... Um, in you know, in, in um, sorry, um, mass transit in cities, etc. Why build infrastructure? A lot, I will say that a lot of this infrastructure isn't used. A lot, the high speed rail in China is not making a profit. But China believes that if you build the infrastructure, you make it possible for the rest of the country to progress. And so right now, people aren't traveling very much from Western China to Eastern China. Um, and the people who are traveling might be, um, you know, might not have the money to do a lot of, tra of that travel. But once you make it possible for high speed shipment of goods from Western China to Eastern China, then people will build factories in Western China where labor is cheaper and ship those goods to Eastern China. Once you have highways, you make it possible for grapes, which, were, which are wonderful sweet grapes, which are grown in Xinjiang, you make it possible to sell them all over the country, right? Because now you can get them. And so China's been willing to invest in a lot of infrastructure that isn't returning a profit immediately because it thinks it's going to turn that profit very quickly in the future by bringing up the economy of all of the places that are now better connected. All right. um, so how do we fight that? As I said, I don't think we need to fight it. What I think we need to do is understand how we should be competing in this world. Um, this is a graph of how, of on the one side, corporate patents awarded to US firms. That's the dark line up here. And the bottom is US imports from China. 
And as, US, as imports from China to the US go up, corporate patents go down. What does that say? That doesn't, that, that's not a story about good substitution. That is, it's not a story that's about, you know, China is able to sell technology to the US cheaper, and so we can't, we no longer make it in America. That's a story about American innovation. Why has American innovation been flat and then declining? If we want to be able to compete with China, and in fact, able to rise as China rises, we have to do, we have to take advantage of complementarity. We have to make sure that we are producing, innovating, creating the high tech, high value goods, right, that other people are going to want, and that can be made affordable to us through this kind of worldwide creation. Um, and I can talk a lot more about this, because one of the things that ha we see very clearly over the last 30 years is that as China starts import exporting goods to the US, American manufacturing goes south, but not all of American manufacturing, only in certain areas, that's not surprising, areas where you have more competition, right? But then what happens? Business doesn't move into those areas. The government doesn't send assistance, our government doesn't send assistance into those areas, into those states where Chinese competition has closed down manufacturing, hasn't helped the people um, who are mostly older, white, and not college educated, hasn't helped those people find, get new skills and find new jobs. Right? This is an American problem. Right? The problem here is not that China's good at selling things. It's that we aren't getting our act together to continue to innovate upwards, as we were able to do through the 1930s and 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s. Okay. All right. Now let me turn to the party. Um, you know, your image, and it's not a bad image, of the CCP, of any communist party, is probably, you know, rows and rows of people in the same uniform, little red stars on their caps, sort of like this, marching straight in line. And that's what the CCP looked like under Mao Zedong. What does the CCP look like today is two main features. One is merit-based recruitment. And what that means is that the Chinese Communist Party deliberately goes, recruits in colleges and looks for the smartest students, tries to convince them to join the party. You don't have to join the party in China. Most people are not part of the party in China. But if you are smart, you're getting great grades, you're a leader, the party's going to come to you and say, you know, we'd like you to join up. This is the way that you can be patriotic even as you are successful. There's no contradiction between your economic success you know, and your party membership. You know, be part of us. China goes to the most successful businesses, most of whom are not run, you know, weren't created by the state and aren't run by the party. And it says, you are this great entrepreneur. We value what you are doing. We want you to join the party because this is a way that you're going to take your talents and your, you know, drive and your ambition and put it to service for your country. All right. The second thing the, pop, the party does is it creates dual leadership structures um, in all sorts of public, um, in all of its public um, organizations like universities. I'll tell you the university story because that's the one I'm best at. Um, but you know, also in private companies. So what's dual leadership? Well, I'm a professor 
and I, I belong to a department. My department has a chair. Many departments are part of the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts, and the college has a dean. And then the many deans are all to all report to a president, right? In China, you have a college president, but you also have a college party secretary. And you have deans of, you know, the dean of the public policy school. There's also the party secretary of the party school, of the policy school. And then you, within each department, you have a department chair, but you also have a department party secretary. Within state-owned companies or public organizations, the chair and the party secretary, or the dean and the party secretary, the per who's the party secretary that is on that leadership level, is supposed to work together with, that, with the leadership. So it's co-leadership. Right? It's, um, and, so, um, it's, and then if it's a private company, the party, which doesn't have an official role in the private company, will set up what's sort of like a shadow, um, a, sh a shadow hierarchy, you know, where it will have a secretary, a party secretary that's in charge of every level in the hierarchy. And so something really interesting is going on here because the party isn't ordering the college or the business, you know, or the city or the, or the province isn't saying this is what you have to do. It's saying we want to be co-leaders, we want to have both voices in this conversation. Right? And so party leadership is you see party leadership not just because they're getting orders from the top. As a matter of fact, generally they aren't getting orders from the top. But you see party leadership infused at these different levels. Right. One implication of this is that we are not going to be able to say to the best and brightest in China, to say to Chinese leaders, business leaders, government leaders, you know, nonprofit leaders, etc., um, the party's ideas are horrible, or the party is a dictatorship and won't let you do what you want. We won't be able to say that because they'll turn around and say, well, yes, we have party influence. But our party works together in, with the leaders of my company. It works together with the leaders of my organization. It doesn't dictate. It influences, but we also influence back. Right. And we're not going to be able to say, oh, look at these you know, stupid people who join the party, and they all think alike, and there's these automatons, and you know, they're all going off the cliff like lemmings. Because in fact, what the party has done, right, has tried to reach out to the people who are the smartest, who are the most creative, etc. Now, I don't want to overstate this. There are lots of smart, creative people. There are lots of leaders who are not party members in China. One of the interesting things about China's rise, at least up till now, is that that has not prevented them from having success. Right. And because China, the party doesn't look like the kind of dictatorship that we think it looks like in the West, a lot of our criticisms of the party don't make any sense or are seen as you know, over-criticisms, exaggerations to the Chinese themselves. Let me talk about the Great Firewall because I think this is a really good example of how party influence works in China. Now, we all know this Great Firewall is, if anybody doesn't know, the sort of blocking of websites um, from the outside. And Google, famously, Google and YouTube and Facebook and Gmail, et cetera, are blocked. Um, but it's not just blocking. It's also that there's very, 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 very active content moderation right, in China. So that you know, people put up you know, um, uh, 
start a discussion, put up a criticism, etc. And then a moderator will come along and be able to take that off the web. Now, if, when we hear about this, we think, my god, that must be the most boring web ever. But it's not. China actually has greater internet penetration than the United States. It's all because of cell phones. Even workers who have you know, uh, less than a high school degree will use their cell phones constantly, will be on websites constantly. There are very, very, very active blogging. There's very active inst you know, versions of Instagram. There are very active comment sections. There's very active any, you know, their version of tweeting. Um, anything, and there is a ton of commercial activity on the internet. And so what Chinese, Chinese don't see what they don't see, but the world that they see is also a really, really active, vibrant, commercially, um, commercially active world. And so the way to think about this is it's not that these you know, nice people hanging around the computer aren't able to see or do or talk to each other. They're still doing all those things, but there's sort of a web over it. right? The internet is so big that you know, they don't have access to this part of the internet, but the part of the internet they have access to is plenty busy and active on its own. When I take students to China, which is how I, as um, Dave was saying, I do a lot of stuff with American social policy. That was what I did for 20 years only. And then we started bringing students to China. And I said, you know, I'll, I'll, go, and I'll, go, I'll go along and take them and help them um, and learn about China. Um, so we take our phones to China. and. You know, American websites are blocked. And what do our students do? The first couple of days, they are just tearing their hair out. You know, they, well, I can't post on Facebook. I can't like, tell people where I am. I took a picture of my food, and I don't have anywhere to post the food, right? <laughs> and then they're like, oh, I can't you know, post on Facebook, but I can still you know, put things on Dropbox and put up links on Dropbox and have my friends access them on Dropbox. You know, I can't get my Gmail, but if they listen to me, they all set up Yahoo Mail profiles before they left, and they can get all their email on Yahoo. Not only that, there's a really active VPN, v, really active VPN activity in China which basically allows you, the Chinese word for it is to jump the wall. Right? So that you can use a VPN, which basically disguises where you're coming from, you know, um, and use Google and Facebook and Gmail and YouTube, etc. Again, I have a lot, I can talk about this for a long time. But the point here is that this is a really good example of what the Communist Party does. It's not, no longer dumb enough to say, just look inward. Instead, it says, look outward if you want, but let us protect you from the bad stuff, the f fake stuff, right? The wrong stuff, you know. And as long as you know, I can still have an experience of using, getting what I want to know. I don't miss what I'm not getting. Um, so here, what's the American alternative to this? And if I, I hope I have convinced you of something, which is that just saying that the CCP is bad is not going to change China's minds. What does change the minds of Chinese? There are 290,000 Chinese students in the United States, undergraduates and graduates. They live in America. They have American friends. They interact with an internet that is not blocked. Um, and if they go back to China, they know what they're missing. Right? There are, China has sent over, since from 2005 to, 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 20, to 2023, I didn't count the last two, 
224.8 million visitors from China have come to the US. It's visitor visa, visitors' visas. Think about many of you I see are of the age, as am I, when you remember the Cold War. How many Russian students were coming to the US? How many Russians, how many East German visitors were coming to the US? China cannot prevent its people from living in this globalized world, right? And so what we have to do is when they're here, point out to them what they're missing, how is our freedom and our democracy, which I have to say is sometimes a mess, but why is it better? Or why sh should you at least be trying to move China towards a more democratic place? Right. That's the American alternative, and we have a way to make it work. All right, so finally, let me talk a little bit about China's global power. Um, remember, as I just said, China no, cannot close its people off from the globalized world. And instead of being isolationist like it used to be, China's now pushing outward. So many of you have probably heard about the Belt and Road Project. And Belt and Road is basically China's way of looking back all the way to the Tang Dynasty, to the, what, to what we, the Renaissance in the West when Chinese traders were actively going to Europe and Europe was sending traders, explorers to China. When many of you probably don't know that Buddhism is not originally a Chinese religion. Buddhism came from India. Right? The Indians brought Buddhism to China through the Silk Road and the Chinese sent pilgrims back to India. So China has not been a walled off country for most of its existence. And the Chinese government said, we are going to try to use that as an inspiration and recreate these economic ties, these e this economic cooperation, um, businesses all over the world. <coughs> and one reason I I have two maps which basically say the same thing, tell you the same thing, all of these connections. But I also want to look, you to look at the color here. Look at all the green. In all the countries where, of, where there's dark green, China is that country's number one trading power. All the countries that are the sort of middle green, China's their number two trading power. You know, in the lightest green, China's the number three trading partner. China's globalized, it's reaching out. When you reach out and you make those kinds of connections, partly the reason you're doing it is to make money, of course, but partly you're doing it to make friends, right? Um, let's look within China itself. Um, Many of you probably remember the time when Tibet was really in the American news and people were talking about free Tibet and celebrities were, you know, working um, for the cause of Tibet and, the, um, you know, and the Dalai Lama is still, I think, a very respected leader was, you know, very, um, very much uh, pushed out as a voice of a Tibet that is not free. Um, many of you have heard of Xinjiang and the internment camps that the Chinese government has set up in Xinjiang, its western province. Um, Mongolia, you may not know, is divided into two. There is the Mongolia that is a Russian province, but also a Mongolia, Inner Mongolia, that's the name of the province that is part of China. Um, there is Taiwan, of course, which I probably don't need to introduce really to you, but that little dot Hong Kong. China sees all of these places as linked. If Hong Kong is able to declare independence, then Taiwan will want to do that. If Xinjiang has, um, you know, if, Xing, if the Uyghurs in Xinjiang organize to create East Turkestan, the Tibetans 
will organize as well and want to break off. And in Chinese eyes, and to be fair, Chinese history as well, these parts are, the, this create, all of these are parts of China, but also importantly, they create basically a buffer zone for China against outsiders who might be hostile, against hostile countries. Um, and so when America says, we're going to stand up for human rights in Tibet, and we're going to stand up for human rights in Xinjiang, and we're going to stand up for the right of Taiwan to be an independent nation, what China hears is you want to break off parts of China. You want to turn us back to that century of national humiliation when, of course, if Xinjiang becomes free, then they're going to be allies with the United States if they think the US supported them. And if the Tibetans become free, then they're just going to be brought into the Indian orbit, and India is an enemy of China. And Taiwan, if Taiwan becomes free, well, John Foster Dulles is, I don't remember if I had, oh, actually I do have this slide. Taiwan is 105 miles from the mainland. Roughly the distance of Ann Arbor to South Haven. They're really close. But more importantly, think about Key West to Cuba, 103 miles. We remember a time in America's history when we got pretty upset about Russia putting missiles in Cuba. And we all probably know, but we probably haven't really put it together in our minds, the US has a naval base on Cuban territory, Guantanamo Bay, of course. That naval base has been there well before Russia and Cuban Revolution and all of that. It was ceded to the US in the Spanish-American War. And when we think, you know, China's, in, how could China invade, how could China invade Taiwan? From China's point of view, if Taiwan is independent and allied with other countries, you essentially have a hostile enemy 100 miles from the shore. Moreover, they say, you know, if the US can put a naval base and refuse to remove it on Cuba, what right do you have to tell the Chinese that they shouldn't have, you know, a naval base on a, on a country, on an area that they believe is their own? Again, I love to talk about Taiwan, so really happy to answer questions about it. I'm not saying this is right. What I'm saying is this is how Chinese think about Taiwan and why it's such an issue for them, right? Why it's so threatening to them. Last thing I'm gonna talk about on this is just Hawaii to the US mainland, 4,000 miles away. You know, what, now, um, Despite the fact that Hawaii is 4,000 miles away from the US mainland, we don't think it's ridiculous that Hawaii should be a state, right? <laughs> All right. So how can we, how can we you know, defeat this? Or what can we do? I want to tell you a story about the AIIB, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. So in the 19, late 1990s, 97, I think, I'm not positive. Um, China said, you know, this infrastructure modernization approach that we have, modernization through infrastructure, it's done great things for us. We think it will do great things for the world. We're going to create a world development bank, you know, like the World Bank, that bring countries together, invest in other countries, help them modernize, everybody makes money, you, you know, this is great. And the AIB said, Deliver, we're not just going to be a Chinese development bank. We are going to go out and you know, invite European nations to be part of it. And we're going to go out and invite 
Russia to be part of it, and we're going to go out and invite Japan and Korea to be part of it, and we're even going to go out and invite the U.S. to be part of it because we think this approach to modernization is really great. And President Obama said, no thank you. Not only did President Obama say, no thank you, he said to England and to France and to our other allies in Europe, you don't want to join up to this. And England and France and Italy, et cetera, et cetera, looked at what the AIB was going to do, and they said, actually, we think this is a pretty good idea, and we're going to join up. And the lesson for us here is, do we have more influence if we're part of the bank, or do we have more influence if we're outside the bank? The US has never really had to face this problem. We're used to being in a world where we're sort of top, right? And we have development banks that we fund, like the World Bank, that other countries are a very active part of. And we think that's just fine, right? But we can't count on other countries in the world to say, America's always going to be better than the alternative. And in this case, remember, the alternative isn't China. The alternative is an international group of nations. Right. And so can we, can we function in a world where we are very important in the world and we have lots of allies, but we have to bring them along they're not just going to come because we say so, you know. And are we going to be able to function in a world where China's doing something similar? Allies, maybe they're not with us all the time. Maybe they're not even with us on the most important sets of issues. But they're with us some of the time. Can we cope with that? Can we function smartly in that. And so here are two just sort of quick things that might make you think. You might remember, have heard that recently um, Saudi, not, um, Iran, and um, the UAE created this agreement. Iran and the UAE, United Arab Emirates, have been um, enemies for a while, and the Chinese brokered that deal. And then just recently, um, Saudi, um, Iran, and um, the UAE created this agreement. Iran and the UAE, United Arab Emirates, have been um, enemies for a while, and the Chinese brokered that deal. And then just yesterday, I was reading, just last week, um, President Xi and President Zelensky of Ukraine had their first call, and Anthony Blinken, our Secretary of State, said, you know, if China can play a constructive role in this debate, we welcome them as part of it. If they can bring peace, because Russia's not listening to us, but maybe Russia will listen to China, then we welcome them in to this, you know, to this world. And so that's the, we're still not on the same side, right? China didn't say, goodbye to Russia, we're going to join up with the Americans. But can we function in a world where you can still interact even if you're not always allies? So I hope I have at least made you think about countering China's economic development and its party leadership and its national independence with actions that the US can take. Right. With the things that we know well how to do. We are great at making friends in the world. We are really proud right, of our free and open democratic society. And we are the world's economic powerhouse. We can, keep, we can counter China by being what we are and doing what we do well rather than trying to undercut parts of China's self-understanding, part of the China's, you know, um, China's policies, 
that they are really, and with some justification, quite proud of. Right. This is the China that we are dealing with. One that wants to be independent, progressive, quick to advance, cosmopolitan, and scientific. Are we willing to adopt those principles for ourselves? Thank you. Okay. Do, do you think uh, any of China's reluctance to condemn the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, relates to their fear or their interest in someday taking over Taiwan, uh, which would be kind of a similar situation? Sure. Um, yes, I think that um, the argument that Russia is making, you know, that the Ukrainians are really, you know, part of Russia, culturally part of Russia, you know, that there are Russian Ukrainians in the Crimea who wanted to be part of Russia, that is an argument that they, you know, that they would like to make for Taiwan as well. Um, and also, I think the, the sort of more important piece of this is that they really believe that big countries, great countries, have a sphere of influence and that that sphere of influence should not be contested. You know, so what Ukraine and Russia can work out among themselves, and maybe that's not, you know, Russians, Russia swallowing up Ukraine, um, but whatever, what they can work out for themselves Nobody else, what's NATO doing getting in the middle of that, right? It's their business, right? China, what is, what's the U.S. getting in the middle of that for? The U.S. is 6,000 miles away. It's, you know, that's our business. And also, by the way, what happens in the South China Sea, you know, the Philippines and Thailand, we, and Vietnam, we can, we should be able to work all those things out. What's the U.S. coming in, you know, to do? So that's also part of it, this belief that, you know, great countries are entitled to their sphere of influence. And they would say, think about the U.S.'s sphere of influence. Think about the importance that America played. We didn't colonize, but we played an extremely important role in Central America. We played a pretty important role in South America. Nobody, the Brits didn't come and challenge us there. Why should you now challenge us? And I said, I don't have to agree with it to sort of show you what the logic is. Um, I just had a couple quick um, questions. When I was in China and people were making $34 a month, $4 rent, we had not on any level compete economically with that, no. those goods and services. Yeah. Because our burden and overhead, because we pay all these things. No, no. So if I want a pair of socks from China in Walmart, they're a dollar. They're made here, they're going to be twelve ninety five. Um, we have this image, we tend to have this image, I'm not entirely sure where it comes from, about, you know, Chinese being delicate and humble and, you know, very agreeable and, you know, quiet and docile, and I don't know, if you ever heard my mother and my aunts together for like, you know, you, China, um, I don't know what the report, I don't know what the numbers are during the pandemic. Prior to the pandemic, China had over 100,000 um, essentially riots is too hard, like street protests a year. Most of them around fighting the local government for taking their land and paying them not enough. Um, if there, I, I, so the part of what you said that I would really sort of ask you to rethink is that Chinese are happy to be told what to do, and they're happy to, you know, make low wages, and they're happy to work 12 hours a day because they believe that the government knows what's best for them. 
I'm sorry, I miss I misspoke that. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they're not happy. I don't I don't the happy wasn't even a part of the this is the reality of their life. Not happy, not sad, not confused. Yeah. So let me yep, yeah, so okay. So let me then tell you about the other half, right? Which is how has China had this sort of this, you know, moved out of poverty so quickly? One of the ways it's done it is by moving people, and I shouldn't even say moving people because they move themselves. In the 1960s, um, China had restrictions on, on movement. So if you were from, you know, a farming village in Guangdong province, you know, that's where you were supposed to be and you couldn't leave and go get a job in Shanghai. One of the things that happened after reform and opening is that those restrictions on movement were lifted. What year was that? Um, so it's a gradual process. And so it was lifted first for the cities that were special economic zones, so you could move to those cities. And that was 1978, yeah. 1970, 1980, 81. Um, and then it was to larger cities, and then it was. But one of the things about this um, system is that even though you have moved, your residence hasn't moved, your residence is still back in the, in the village that you came from, and so your social services are tied to those villages. On the other hand, your land rights are also tied to those villages. Um, so a lot of the people that you're talking about who are working 12 hours a day for whatever amount of three or four dollars, you know, a, 12 hours a day for three or four dollars per day, were there not because the government had sent them there. Almost all, actually all of them, were there because they weren't making enough money to eat in the village that they came from and they were moving towards better economic opportunity in the city that they went to. I'd be interested in hearing your comments about the Chinese efforts, I believe, in the Sea of Japan, building islands, actually, and along those islands. I, um, I have slides. Dealing with uh, yeah, I have slides. Uh, airports and naval bases. Yes, what are yes. their objectives, and what are your comments there? Yeah. This is the South China Sea area. Um, and as you, so China's up here, but of course, Vietnam, Cambodia, the Philippines, Thailand, and what you see here, this red line, is what the Chinese claim. Um, this part of the ocean should be China's ocean. Meanwhile, the Philippines are saying, look, this part of the ocean should be our ocean. And Malaysia is saying here, and um, Malaysia is over here and over there too. Malaysia is really big. Um, this. I know you're not going to really be able to see the pictures, much less the words, but what I want to tell you there is that every triangle is a military base that somebody has. Okay, So the Malaysians have a bunch of military bases outside of their waters. And the Philippines have a bunch of dark blue circles that are all in the area they claim for their own, but on the but the Malaysians are in the same place. And the, yes, the Chinese are in the places where the Malaysians and the Philippines are. And I'll tell you, even Taiwan, which is not that close, um, has a white square. Oh, it has airfields right there. Um, this is a really busy part of the world. <laughs> um, so, what is, what, so what is China doing? China is thinking. The Philippines, the U.S. has, you know, law, you, the U.S. has established a lot bases in the Philippines. Has this long relationship with the Philippines. Is now rebuilding our military, you know, commitment um, interaction with the Philippines. We shouldn't think of those as Phil if that's the case. Maybe those aren't Philippine bases. Maybe those are U.S. bases. And if there are US bases, we better be there. And a lot of these islands are 
to be perfectly honest, sort of rocks. And so, yes, we are going to dump sand into those areas to make it possible for us to put, whether it's mon they're, they're not able to put very much, but monitoring equipment, etc. There are some areas, let's see, this where is, like the, on the larger islands that are really islands where airfields can go in. Um, you know, so I, I would say what's going on here is very similar. China isn't claiming those waters and saying everybody else get out. But China is saying we have a right to operate there and you know everybody else in the neighborhood says they have a right to operate there too. Um, now, do we think that it adds to the cause of peace for lots of people to be building you know, various monitoring or military formations or airfields on these you know, in this lane? Probably not. But here's the other really important thing that goes on in the South China Sea. There's a ton of shipping. All of China's oil that comes from the Middle East goes through the South China Sea. And part of what China is saying is, if you, were go if you meaning the United States, were going to blockade us, Here's a whole set of bases that the Philippines and the Malaysians, etc., have that you could use, and you could starve us. We need to keep these waters free. Free meaning we need to maintain our free movement within. So this, the you know the, um, yeah, I, I don't, I mean, I don't know that I have a ton to say here. The, you know, I clearly, a lot of these smaller countries are sort of looking at China and saying, if you wanted to blockade us, you could do that too, right? And China's recently built the large, it's now I think the largest navy by a bit in the world, you know, bigger than our own. Um, and so, those countries are looking at China and saying, we don't want you to shut us out. And China's looking at these countries and saying, if you're all friends of the US, maybe you'll try to shut us out. It's not a great situation. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I'm trying to understand a little better that second ladder and the business usefulness of that second ladder. Now, I know other countries do gain input for example, from the factory. In Germany, they have a betriebs, betriebsrat, which is workers' input. However, it's unclear to me how outsiders could be helpful to a company. Yeah. And normally in a company, it's successful because the people have experience, years of experience, knowledge in this. And how can an outside political force be helpful? That's such a great question because it really shows that I didn't explain it well enough. The people who are on that ladder, ladder, they're taking the job of party secretary, but they're not coming in from the outside. They're coming in from the inside. And so I'm a professor. The I chair opens up in my department. I can apply to be the chair. Or the party secretary of the department, that job opens up. I can apply to be the party secretary. You know, so the people are coming in in the same way that they would, you know, they might be hired from one university to the other or move from one city to another, etc. But they're people who are, they're not sort of like sent by the government and placed in where you, you know, placed in where you are. Um, they are, at, they, they are um, from within the company or that university or competitor company or university themselves. Um, it's not a fantastic system um, because, as you can imagine, if you have two bosses, unless you and the other boss really get along, you know, you're going to be fighting all the time. Or one boss ends up being superior to the other boss. Sometimes it's the secretary, sometimes it's the, ex the other executive. Um, so in, I mean, this, this isn't a very efficient system, um, but 
it does mean that it's a system where you're not getting orders from the outs. You're not thinking about the party as this outside force, which is telling you to do something or preventing you from doing something. Because what the party is is embedded in, connected to, you know, the, all the levels of leadership um, already. Right? And so the point here is not, God, this is a great system. We really ought to, uh, uh, to, really ought to adopt it. The point here is that the party isn't seen as outside in the way that we think of it as outside. I was interested in your perspective on demo the demographics in China because they had the one child requirement and then uh, if they had a female they were more likely to abort it so they'd have a son and now they're not they're trying to get them to have more kids and they don't want to and they got an aging population and now India has a higher population than China. Yeah. Um, it's a challenge and an opportunity for China. Um, the challenge is obvious, as you just laid it out. It's an aging population. One of the reasons it's aging is because life expectancy has gone up. Um, you know, it is a, it, the, uh, to give you a sense of how much life expectancy has gone up, the retirement age for women in China is 55. The retirement age for men is 60. You know, so the, the, um, now there are plenty of people working who are above those ages. Um, mostly they're working outside of, um, it's complicated, but, um, but, my, but my point is that the, the, there's a very large population of people who are retired and have some money um, to spend um, and yet need to be paid pensions, et cetera, that you know, all come from younger people who are working. Um, the, so it's a, real, it's a real problem for China, and it's a real problem um, that not only China, but of course Korea and Japan, um, Asian, other Asian countries, and you know, to some extent we are also facing. Um, our population increase now, if, if we didn't have immigrants, we, wouldn't have, we would be facing a population of negative birth rate as well. I mean, what gives us a positive birth rate is the fact that we, immigrants who are in their childbearing years and also, if therefore, in their work years are coming to the U.S. Um, one of the issues with the population in China, is, and one of the issue, one of the sort of oddities of the Chinese um, economic system, is that people actually don't have great social services. They don't have great social policies. My students are always amazed because they think, well, it's a communist country. That means everybody you know, should be equal. And in fact, there's as much inequality in China, income inequality in China, as there is in the US. Um, but we don't have a great social service system, and yet our social ser service system is in many ways more generous than the Chinese social service system. And so one thing that is that China has really been trying to balance is people demand a better social service system. Um, and where is, can, where is the money going to come from? Can we um, push back their demands for a better social system by having enough economic growth so that their, you know, their wages increase and so they're not looking to the government as much. And so the real problem for China is can it maintain the sort of crazy amount of economic growth, the crazy amount here being if you think the U.S. 2% economic growth a year, China's at the 7 to 9% per year in the last decade, right? And so that kind of economic growth, if you put money in people's pockets that they then save, and so Chinese have not demanded 
better social, well, they're demanding it, but they're able to live without better social services because they're self-insuring. They're saving a lot of money for their retirement. They're saving a lot of money for their medical bills. Um, you know, so that's a place where I think China, this system could really fall apart because people are used to a much better standard of living now than they were when they were young. And the only way you can get that standard of living is to have crazy economic growth or, more, or moderate economic growth, but a lot more workers producing stuff. So I, you know, and the, the, other, the other thing I should say is that China has been able to keep a large part of its middle class happy um, because they've been able to, they've been able to to benefit from um, house construction and house buying from real estate, and so it's not unusual for somebody who is you know a middle level civil servant you know to have a house they live in and a house they helped their child purchase and maybe a house that they may or may not be able to rent out as um, you know at, to for extra income um, in the countryside people have been able to have that sort of you know the private savings from the fact that cities and towns and cities have been growing very rapidly and when they move into you know new territory they they take the land but they pay people for the land and that's a windfall for a lot of people um, that both of those things are running out you know the real estate market in China is pretty bad and the land the available land for cities to take is getting used up and so there is a big economic problem for China that is coming um, and as you're saying the population the demographics are not um, helpful to them as at all um, one of the I mean so the opportunity here, the opportunity part, is that China's really looking for ways to grow their economies. And one of the way, and so we talked about infrastructure investment. They are crazy investing in universities. China created 100 new universities in the last decade. Um, all national universities, you know, not private universities. Um, and as a result, they have a very high unemployment rate among college graduates. They, because the business isn't there yet for those graduates to move into, right? But they're hoping, just like the, you know, high-speed rail, that once you have those people, they will move in to you know, highly productive fields. And so we'll see how that works out.